comes, here he comes. There's the trumpets, there's the drums, here he comes. Hop along, Cassidy, here he The desolate country between the National Gold Smelter Company and the town of Dorado was a fertile field for desperados. So far, the local sheriff had been unable to stop the marauders. Wagon after wagon was robbed after it left the smelter. Dorado had prospered because the gold shipments were handled by the local bank, but now it faced ruin. No wonder my friend Richard Wall, the president of the bank, had sent for me. I'd been through Dorado when it was a bustling community. Now it was almost a ghost town. Howdy, Sheriff. Stranger in town? Yep. My name's Smith. Hmm. How unusual. Uh-huh. Got an unusual first name, too. John. Hey, you look like a healthy fella. What's a good place to eat around here? Try Ms. Murphy's boarding house. Thanks. No, that way, Mr. Smith. I've got other business here in town, if you have no objections. Or are you the Snoopy kind of sheriff? <laughs> I do for you. I'd like to see Mr. Wald. Mr. Wald, of course. Uh, your name, sir? Smith. John Smith, a cattle buyer. Uh, John Smith. Yeah. Uh, one moment, sir. What is it now? Business is picking up. A Mr. John Smith, a cattle buyer, wants to see you. Well, show him in. Yes, sir. And Don. Yes, sir. Try not to act like you haven't seen a new customer for weeks. <clears throat> yes, sir. Come in, Mr. Smith. Thank you. Well, hello. Come in, Mr. Smith. That'll be all more. Glad to see you, <laughs> Huffy. <laughs> nice to see You're you. You're looking wonderful. That John Smith caught me unawares. It is rather an odd name. Isn't it? <laughs> well, let's get out this problem of yours, huh? And I have a problem, too. Come around here. Pull up a chair and sit down. Thanks. On this map here. My old friend gave me a detailed account of the desperate situation facing him and the community. The National Gold Smelter was located in the midst of many small gold mines, practically every one of them individually owned. Wald's Bank put up the money to build this smelter, a cooperative venture. After the ore had been produced and made into gold bars, it was shipped to the railhead two days' ride west of Dorado. Despite strict secrecy and thorough investigation of everyone who worked the smelter, the thieves always knew when the gold was leaving and whether the wagon would take the upper or the lower road. Wald and the miners stood to lose their entire investment. Some of the miners are already passing the radio and heading straight for the railhead. Uh, we'll find some way to cure this. Oh, have you spoken to Red yet? Oh, yeah. <laughs> he don't seem very happy either. <laughs> I don't blame him. He found out two sheriffs were killed here, and we couldn't get anybody to take the job until you sent him. Oh, don't worry about Red. He can take care of himself. Well, he hasn't had a chance to prove anything yet. I've been holding up the gold shipments. Well, you must have an awful lot of gold stacked up out at the smelter. Fifty thousand dollars. Fifty thousand? Right. Hey, I better get to work. I'll go out and look around for some uh, cattle. <laughs> I'll hold up that gold shipment until I hear from you again. That's good. Expect your lunchtime, Don. You need a trim, all right. Hello, Hiram. Morning, Richard. See, we have a stranger in town. My name is Tilden. I'm mayor of this fair city. Also own a general store. Prices are reasonable. Merchandise guaranteed. And I'm the best barber within 100 miles. Glad to know you. What's your name? Smith. Uh, cattle buyer. Oh, is that so? Well, say, I can help you with that, too. 
I know every head of cattle around here. Say, Richard, I just got me a new gramophone record. Oh, it's the funniest thing you ever heard. It's about a fella who takes his gal to the opera house, and this fella... A later Hiram. It's nice to have met you, Mayor. Yeah. I'll see you later. Bye, Mitch Smith. Now, this fella, he pays a lot of money for himself and his lady friend to go and see this here opera, and he doesn't know that the thing is in a foreign language. Uh, just so... a moment, Hiram. Huh? I'll hear your record later, if I have to. Uh, you, uh, you're still worried about them raiders, ain't you? If you'd come in on the investment, you'd be worried, too. Well, I warned you not to build that smelter, to let the miners do the best they could with their own gold. They'd have traded in Dorado just the same. Maybe I'm a little smarter than you think I am. Well, don't worry. That new sheriff seemed like a capable fellow. Things will turn out all right. Bye. Bye, Hiram. Where are you aiming to buy your cattle, Mr. Smith? Hey, you are Snoopy. Why, you... Uh, no offense, Sheriff. I'm going to get a room at the hotel so you won't have to ask any more questions. Questions? I'd like to ask him how he talked me into taking this job. Sheriff Connors! Craziest thing I ever did. Yes, Mr. Mayor? I was just talking to Wall at the bank. He says they have a big shipment of gold, even the smelter. Hope you can give them all the protection they need. Yeah, I'll do my best. When's he shipping? And he didn't say, and I didn't ask. Ain't none of my business. Well, gotta get along. You better come over and see me. Need a haircut. Yeah? Could I speak to you for a minute, Mr. Smith? Why, sure. Come right in, Sheriff. <laughs> Hi. How are you? Good to see you. Boy, this is the way it ought to be. <laughs> Red didn't like the business of us pretending to be strangers. I told him it had to be that way. The crooks we were after were clever men. He'd been in town two weeks, hadn't found out much except the best place to eat, and the cheerful news that the last two sheriffs were murdered. He said he couldn't even recruit a posse. Everybody was scared to death. Have you checked on everybody at the smelter? All of them men of good character. Beats me how the information about them shipments leaks out. Who's in charge out there? Well, there's a fellow named Sid Michaels. I had a couple of talks with him, and he's just as worried as everybody else. The drivers and the guards on the wagons wouldn't be tipping anybody off. They'd be plum fools if they did. Too many of them get killed. Uh, not much to go on there. Where's your room? Just about two rooms down the hall here. Now, we better not be seen together. And I'll get word to you if I want to talk oh, to you. Oh, but Hoppy, can't we go on? And my name is John Smith. Remember that. Get out. I'm Pocahontas. Get up. Because <laughs> the king was responsible for the whole thing. When the opera was over, everybody on stage was either dead or dying. The boy and his gal were able to figure out that much, even though they didn't understand I. <laughs> Then the gal saw the peanut man and whispered to her feller, my, those peanuts smell good. And he calls out, boy, move the peanuts closer so she can smell them better. <laughs> <laughs> so long, this is your old friend, Joe the Laughing Boy, who says, he who laughs last, laughs best. <laughs> I guess so she can smell the peanuts better. <laughs> that fella sure is comical. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Yeah. Tilden, if you play that foolish record once more, I'll quit. Trouble with you is you ain't got no sense of humor. Uh, Mr. Smith, uh, this is Miss Betty Black, the postmistress. How do you do? And she'll give you your mail after she reads the postcards. <laughs> Say, maybe I ought to make my own records. I'm sorry, Mr. Smith, but his honor drives me crazy with those comic recordings. Well, we could have music or pretty singing on those records. But no, he has to hear Joe, the laughing boy. If I want pretty singing and playing, I'll do it myself. Now, what'll it be, Mr. Smith? Want me to tell you where to buy cattle? No, well, I... Well, uh, do you want a shave or a haircut? Not right now. 
Well, uh, want to buy something? No, I just wanted to talk. Oh, well, in that case, you better come into the mayor's office. Now, uh, tell me, Mr. Smith, what is it you want to talk about? I was talking to your sheriff a while ago. He seems like a nice fellow. He was telling me about the gold robberies. Oh, that Connors talks too much. You know, that's a bad habit a lot of people You're have. absolutely right. I agree with you. Our town's been ruined fast enough without driving away rich cattle buyers. Oh, well, his only concern seems to be that he can't get a posse together. Well, it has been kind of bad. But I'll get some men to ride with him. I'd go myself only for my game leg. Say, while we're talking, why don't I give you a trim? Maybe later. Oh, well, never mind. I, I'm going to customer anyway. All right, Don. I'm ready for you. Sorry, Mayor. I just came in to take Betty to lunch. Oh, well, all right. We don't expect to jump right in the chair Saturday night because you're going to have to wait your turn. Hello, Betty. Hello. I'll be back in an hour. Goodbye, Mr. Smith. And don't let him play any more of those horrible records. <laughs> and the bank might be forced to close. Honey, don't worry so much. If you lose your job, you'll get another one. Where? Mr. Wall can't help it if his bank is ruined. We'll never be able to get married now. Everything will turn out all right. You just wait and see. Betty, I'm desperate. I've got to figure out some way to get money. And fast. Red gave me the directions, and I rode to the smelter office. I wanted to talk to Superintendent Michael. John Smith, I'm a cattle buyer. There's no stock within miles of here, so get going. Oh, but I'm, I'm lost. I can't help you, mister. This is a smelter office. Yeah, I saw your sign. There's two of them. That one over there says no trespassing. Now get moving. Mr. Smith, what's going on here? Do you know this man? Yes, I met him in Dorado. He's the most unfriendly man I've ever seen. I just told him I was lost and he pulled a gun on me. Well, if you'll wait here, I'll see you back to town. Thanks. Come inside, Sheriff. What's Wall got to say? Ship day after tomorrow, by way of the upper road. I hope you'll have protection for me. I've got over $50,000 accumulated. We only want you to send 10000 through. Sort of a test run. I'll meet you with a posse at the Forks. Fine. What do you know about this fellow Smith? Who, him? <laughs> Very little, but he has an honest face. Looks can be deceiving, Sheriff. I don't believe that story about his being lost. Well, I guess you're right. I'll keep my eye on him. The following day, we started organizing a posse. I met his honor and remembered his promise to get men to ride with Red. I also sent Red on down the street. Then the waiter says to the fella, with that parsley, it'll make it look prettier. So the fella says to the waiter, I don't care how pretty it is, I don't want any parsley on my steak. It's like kissing a cow. It don't mean nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, so long, this is your old friend Joe the Laughing Boy, who says, he who laughs last, laughs best. Don, don't tell me you like my last record. Oh, what's that, Mr. Tilton? Oh, the record, yes, it's very funny. Well, I'm glad to see a show on a sense of humor. Well, I suppose it does help. Well, I'll have to be getting along now. Good day, Mr. Tilton, Mr. Smith. Uh, so long, Betty. Don, wait a minute. I wonder what's the matter with him. Maybe he's behind in his work and Wall has built a fire under him. Well, he has been worried about his job. Wald insisted on joining the posse, said he'd leave Don to run the bank, insisted the boy could be trusted. I kept on trying to round up more men. 
Next day, we were all set. Red, Michaels, and Wald were the only ones who'd been told the wagon would take the upper road. From the smelter to this point was open, flat country where the raiders wouldn't dare jump the wagon. But from here on, where we'd arranged to join it, the territory was dangerous. I fought off in patience as I waited for the first sound of the approaching wagon. We waited an hour, no sign of the wagon. I gave Red a gentle hint. Then he made the decision I'd been hoping he'd make for the past 30 minutes. He said we'd better ride on toward the smelter. We backtracked four miles over the upper road, no sign of the wagon. I thought possibly Michael had misunderstood Red's direction, so we headed for the lower road. We hadn't gone very far before we knew why the wagon hadn't met us on the upper road. guards and the driver were dead. The gold shipment was gone. I looked around the ground. I found a trail, but it was too faint to do any good. I told Red and Wall to ride to the smelter and ask Michael why the wagon had taken the wrong road. I'd take the wagon back to town. The next day, Red and I headed for Michael's office. Michael had told Red and Wall he couldn't understand why the wagon had taken the wrong road. He gave the driver strict orders to take the upper road. I was puzzled, and now as I headed for the smelter office, I worked out a plan for Red to draw Michael away from the place. When we got there, we got a surprise. I see. Well, I'll have to be getting back now, Sid. I'll ride part of the way with you. I want to stop in and see Jim's wife. She's all broken up by his death. Sure. better than I expected. You stay here and keep your eyes open. Sure, Hobby. Smith! What I was looking for wasn't in the desk, but I did make an interesting discovery. cabinet held what I'd been searching for. Michaels is coming back. Let him come. Come on. The crumpled piece of paper Don threw away, together with what I'd found in Michael's desk, helped me put the puzzle together. stood around the streets of New York looking up at the top of all them buildings. One of them says to his friend, 
Hank, look at them two flies walking around there on the eighth floor. Hank answered, Clem, I can't see them, but I can sure hear the footsteps. <laughs> <laughs> well, so long. This is your old friend, Joe the Laughing Boy, who says, he who laughs last, laughs best. <laughs> I can't see him, but I can hear their footsteps. <laughs> That's a funny one yet, ain't it, Al? Hmm? Oh, yes, very funny, Your Honor. Well, here, wait a minute. I ain't through with you yet. Here you are. Thank you. So long. Wonder what's come over that boy lately. Seems to be acting kind of funny. I don't think he cares for your records. Oh, no, it ain't that. How about that trim now? No, thanks. Three days later, a gold shipment of $40,000 left the smelter for the railhead. This time, I had secretly picked the road and walled and instructed Michael to use it. Tension was mounting as we watched the wagon making its way on the road below us. I suspected you, but I thought you were old enough to have better sense. Well, those two fellows from the country stood around the streets of New York looking up at the top of all them buildings. One of them says to his friend... Well, there you are. What does it all mean, Hoppy? Well, this is how Tilden knew about the gold shipments. Michaels made the recordings and sent them in to him. I found the recording machine in Michael's office. I also found the code to these records in his office desk. Now, this is how it works. For instance, on this record where he talks about the top of the building, that meant the upper road. In the record where he talks about parsley, that meant the brush road or the lower road. Now, there's a record about the opera. He used the word dead. That meant there'd be no shipment. The one where he talked about pretty, that meant there would be a gold shipment. Sure. And no matter what road you told him to use, Mr. Wall, they switched it. And Michael tipped off his honor. Yeah, you were on the right track, Don. Well, I thought there was something funny about those records. Yeah, and you got pretty close, too. So close that you were suspicious of me. I thought I'd seen one of those dictating machines in Michael's office. That's what I went there to find. <laughs> you just didn't look in the right place. It was in that big cabinet. Well, Tilda and Michaels will have a lot of laughs together in jail. <laughs> For a long time. I wonder if they'll remember this. Oh, so long. This is your old friend, Joe the Laughing Boy, who says, he who laughs last, laughs best. <laughs> Hi, little partners. Have you been doing anything to help Mom around the house lately? You haven't. 
Let's do all we can to help her, huh? I bet you'll have fun doing it, and I know Mom will appreciate it. Will you do that for me? Not till next week, so long, and good luck. There he goes, on his way, down the moonlit trail to where cowboys raised. Hop along, Cassidy. Hop along, Cassidy. He'll return soon again. There's no use to say goodbye until then. The harmless old wooden wagon setting idle in Sandy Morgan's livery stable. Looked harmless anyhow, yet no one within 50 miles of Twin Rivers would have anything to do with it. Sandy couldn't even give it away. Folks called it the Jinx Wagon, and for good reason. It had brought nothing but trouble and heartaches to anyone who had ever owned, ridden, or come in contact with it. The last owner had been killed trying to outrun a pack of renegades. Right after that, Sandy Morgan took over the wagon, but he knew better than to put it in operation. He just let it gather dust, using it more for storage than anything else. So the Jinx Wagon just sat there, out of trouble until a night not long ago when the Twin Rivers Bank was robbed. The bank wasn't far from the livery stable, so it didn't take Sandy any time at all to realize what was happening. What he didn't realize was that the excitement in Twin Rivers that night was going to start a chain of events that would alter quite a few lives and put the jinx wagon back in business. No saddle ponies, mister. Shake them loose. Get them out back and make it fast. Give them a hand, but keep a gun on them. How's it look? It's fixing every building, boss. Hurry it up. Give me that money. Somehow, it just don't seem right, boss. Quit worrying. Without this satchel full of bank money, we can just be three cowpokes riding out of town. They'll stop us and search us, but they'll let us go. Yeah, but with all this money, I still think we should... You ain't paid the money. We'll come back and pick it up when the heat's off, just like we planned. What if someone comes snooping around or moves the wagon? The jinx wagon? Yeah, nobody will touch it. This money's safe like in a, a church. That's why I planned it this way. It'd take a hurricane to move this old wreck. Let's get out of here. Hurricane, nobody in Twin Rivers knew about it. But the morning after the robbery, contrary to the masked bandit's reasoning, the Jinx wagon found a new owner. Dan Clemens, an elderly southerner, was on the last leg of his long journey westward from Georgia. He traveled by stage as far as Twin Rivers, but the last few miles of his trip were off the stage route, so he needed transportation. Sandy told him the story behind the Jinx wagon, but Dan Clemens was not one for superstition. To him, a wagon was a wagon, so he went right ahead and bought it. Sandy dusted a few cobwebs off, outfitted it with harnessing and horses, and the jinx wagon was ready to roll. So Dan Clemens, the proud owner of a wobbly old wagon that up to now had spelled nothing but trouble, rode out of town with a big smile on his face. Me and my saddle pal, Red Connors, didn't feel much like smiling, though, when we heard about the robbery and were asked to try and track down the thieves. We both had a little savings in the bank ourselves.
After we got all the information we'd need from the bank officials, we figured maybe Sandy Morgan could give us some answers. Sandy went on to tell Red and me all about Dan Clemens and his story about coming out from Georgia. Sandy said he wouldn't even have mentioned it, but for the big roll of bills the old man was carrying. It wasn't much to go on, but Red and I figured maybe the wagon was part of the plan too. And if it was, the old gent might lead us right to the rest of the gang. For the next few hours, Red and I put a lot of miles behind us as we tracked the troublesome wagon. Wobbly wheels made the wagon tracks easy to read, and following had been no trouble at all. Yet just a ways up the road, Dan Clemens wasn't finding the going as easy. The Jinx wagon was living up to its name. Uh, if it wasn't for you, you can't have this old wheel. I might have been to the outpost a long while back. Come up there, come up, come up! <laughs> Dead damn markets! I'll never see such a no account collie or wagon. <laughs> You've been nothing but trouble to me ever since I met you. Yeah, you just a little break. That's the fifth time you've done that to me. I'm gonna thump you a good one. Dead down it, old wagon. I'm gonna kick the living teeth out of you, wagon. Oh, 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 oh. Got me in a frenzy wagon. I ain't gonna truckle with you no more, wagon. I should have believed that livery stable fella when he told me you was nothing but trouble. Now, just as soon as I get these horses. Oh! You own this wagon? What, that cockly old piece of trouble? <laughs> I just disowned it. What is all the shooting about? Yeah. That wagon and me, we don't see eye to eye. I'm going one way and it's going t'other. It's got a hex on it. You figuring on leaving it right here in the road? Yeah, I hope to tell you I am. <laughs> I never want to see the darn thing again. Say. I paid real good money for that wagon. Seems to me I can do as I see fit. I'm a U.S. Marshal, old-timer. My name is Hopalong Cassidy. This is Red Connors. Well, please to meet up with you. <laughs> I'm Dan Clements. From Georgia, huh? Well, yeah. Hey, there's been a bank robbery. You mind if we ask you a few questions? <laughs> Pump them at me, son. I got nothing to hide. This good money you were talking about, is that in currency? It sure is. Do you mind if I look at the serial numbers? Oh, not at all, son. Not at all. <laughs> Here it is. This is my life savings. And I work mighty hard for it, too. <laughs> that stable man was a line, boss. That's the wagon well enough. No mistake in it. No mistake in Hopalong Cassidy, either. Well, this is not the stolen money, Red. And there isn't enough of it. Well, I tote fair with everybody, Marshal Cassidy. I ain't one for singing snake songs. <laughs> snake songs? What kind of talk's that? Uh, where I come from down Georgia, we talk plain. Snake songs are slippery stories. You know, tall tales, lies. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds reasonable. Yeah, I guess so, if you're well acquainted with snakes. <laughs> uh, now, if you gents will kind of excuse me, I'll be getting along. I ain't seen my children for quite a spell. Gonna visit your family, huh? Yes, I sure am. My son and daughter. <laughs> they run a store here near a little town up ahead. Can't be too much further. Seems to me you're leaving a good piece of equipment here in the road. Well, son, if you feel that way about it, you're welcome to it. <laughs> <laughs> Say, would you kindly hand me my rifle, Mr. Connor? Uh, 
<laughs> I better help you there, old timer. Looks like you got a bad foot. Yeah, I got it. Trying to kick some sense into that consounded old wagon there. <laughs> Give me your foot here. Uh, here you go. <laughs> yeah, much obliged. Much obliged, Marshal. <laughs> I must be getting old again. <laughs> You're doing all right. Well, so long, gents. So long. Come up, come up, Dad. Come up. Old Dan was such a sorry sight moving down the road that Red and I figured when he cooled off later on, he might find use for the wagon. So knowing that the store Dan had mentioned was just a few miles up the road, we patched up the Jinx wagon and started pulling it. Your great ideas. Come on, let's take the wagon away from him. Trying to take it away from Hopalong Cassidy don't exactly strike me as a bright idea. Well, what do you suggest? Just sit in here watching all that cash roll away? Don't talk stupid. We'll follow him, find out what he does with the wagon. Can't plan to take it far. Too bad the old man didn't keep it. He'd have been a pushover. Jeff, you all around? Paul! Oh, we thought you'd never get here. Yeah, it seems like I fell the same way, Julie, darling, but I made it all right. Is anything wrong? No, I'm just tuckered, Saul. It's good to see you, Paul. Here, let me give you a hand. Yeah, thank you, boy. <laughs> well, I guess that's about all there is to it, children. That cobbly old wagon just conked me on the ankle and driv me into a conniption fit. So I left it right there in the middle of the road. Well, I can't say as I blame you, Pa. I don't know, Jenny. Well, I can understand how Pa feels about it. But that wagon would have sure come in handy here at the store. Yeah, come in handy like a stick of dynamite, maybe. Why, if I brought that cobbly old thing here, the roof would probably fall right in on the store. Oh, oh. <laughs> uh, well, uh, now that we're all one big happy family together again, <laughs> I want that you should keep this for me. Uh, it ain't much, but I thought it might come in handy. <laughs> Most three thousand dollars in there. And Jeff, uh, uh, would you fetch this someplace where it's nice and snug? <laughs> I'll put it in the safe, Pa. See, it's a lucky thing that Jinx wagon didn't run away with your money too, eh, Pa? Yeah. Say, sounds like you've got yourself a customer. Oh, it's just a couple of cowboys drawing a wagon. What kind of wagon? It's just an old wobbly one. Well, turn my cats. That's it. Them cowboys are bringing that wagon here. Hey, take it easy, Paul, your foot. Oh, oh my oh, foot. I tell you, you're in a heap of trouble to keep that Come thing, on, yeah? Yeah. Oh, Jenny. Well, you must be the Clemens. Yes. I'm Hopalong Cassidy. This is Red Connors. Howdy. Boss told us all about you fellas. I told you I didn't want that no count wagon marshal. <laughs> well, I thought maybe he'd change his mind. You know, with a little bit of work, that wagon could be fixed up as good as new. Oh, he's just upset. He'll get over it. <laughs> Won't you come in? Well, thank you kindly, ma'am. Just a minute. We still have work to do, or have you forgotten? Oh, well, shucks, no, Hoppy. It ain't me that's weary. I was just thinking of the horses. Oh, the horses, huh? All right, maybe they should have a little rest. Well, hi, Dan. Uh, Marshal. How's the foot? Yeah, uh, right in the middle, isn't it? Uh, until you brought that spooky wagon here, and now it hurts like blazes. <laughs> you and that wagon. Yeah. Hey, that's pretty swollen. If you don't know it, it ain't nothing. It ain't nothing at all, Marshal. Well, that's enough to make a cripple out of you if we don't do something for it. I better get you to a doctor. Oh, nonsense, nonsense. Ah, uh, we'll put you right in the wagon and everything. Uh, Marshal, not in that done wagon again, please, now. <laughs> all right. Well, then we'll put you on Red's horse. Oh, Come on, Red. It's just as bad. Come on. Here we go. Uh, I finally got him on Red's horse, and we were on our way to the doctor. Did you 
saddles, boys. This won't take long. What's wrong, boss? It's gone. Money's gone. That's what we want to know, mister. We're going to find out starting right now. Get inside. All of you. Come on, Jess. Blake, take care of the horses. Back to the doctors, everything outside the store looked nice and peaceful. I noticed the horses in front, but just figured the store had some customers. Yes, yeah, some customers. When Dan and I walked inside, we were really in for a surprise. Hello, Marshal. Join the party. I told you the roof would fall in if you brought that contraption here. It looked like the roof had fallen in, all right. And while one of the gunnies tied me up, Red was talking a mile a minute, telling me all about the jinx wagon and the money the bank thieves had hidden. Red said they were furious when the money turned up missing and thought sure Dan had found it and stashed it somewhere in the store. When they blew the safe open and found Dan's life savings of $3,000, they were certain it was part of the bank money. So they tore up the store looking for the rest. When they didn't find it, they figured Dan must have the rest of the money on him. So they just settled down to wait for his return. You're pretty foxy, huh? No talking. Let's see if you got any of that cash on you. Listen, old man, I'm tired of talking. Now, where's the rest of that money? And I'm tired of staying in, sonny. I tell you, I don't know nothing about your hard-earned money. Where is it? <laughs> You're a fearsome cuss, ain't you? <laughs> Go ahead, chunk me, I still don't know. You'd better know or I'm gonna kill you. I knew I'd have to think of something fast or he'd carry out his threat. I couldn't endanger everyone else by trying to break loose. But if I could get the thieves out on a wild goose chase, then I remembered something, something Dan had set out on the road. Sure, Dan, you might as well tell him. Huh? Cassidy's just getting smart, mister. You better listen to him. Sure, Dan, sing him a snake song about where you uh, buried the money out on the trail. Yeah, yeah, snake song. Yeah, yeah huh? I suppose I might as well. Well, that's more like it. Yeah. <coughs> where is it? Dan came through like a charter member of the Liars Club. He told a snake song that was a dandy. He really got himself wrapped up telling how he'd found the money, kept part of it, and buried the rest out on the trail. Told the outlaws it was all theirs. He'd tell them right where he hid it. But the leader said Dan would go along and show them where, and threatened to kill him if any of us trailed them. Then he sent one of his men out to hitch up the team horses to the wagon so they could carry Dan. When Dan heard he was going to ride in the jinx wagon, I thought for a moment he'd rather be killed. Listen a minute, Mr. But by the time the team horses were hitched, Dan had resigned himself to the wagon as the lesser of the two evils. As soon as we heard them leave, I got to work on my ropes. Red and I had to get ourselves free, knowing that every second wasted could be the last in Dan Clemens' life. I finally got free and released the others. Then Red and I raced out on the trail of the wagon. Knowing Dan couldn't stall forever, we raced against the time the bank thieves would realize Dan didn't have the slightest idea where the money was. Remember exactly where I buried that darn money. I, was it uh, that tree over there, or, or was it that one? Maybe this will help you remember. Now quit stalling. I'm pretty sure. No, 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 no. It was, uh, it was that tree over there. You better be sure. 
Late, start digging. We spawned the wagon up ahead. I motioned Red to follow me, and we circled quietly toward a small hill behind the outlaws. From the looks of the digging going on, we knew Dan was still singing his snake song. All right, the treasure hunt's over. sweet life. I'm mighty glad you made it, though, son. I was pretty near running out of snake songs. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, you did fine. So yeah. the old jinx wagon. Yeah, that old brake slipped shut just as pretty as you please. <laughs> <laughs> Say, you just trundle that piece of no account in the wagon. I think maybe I can drive it back as far as the store, anyhow. Good. <laughs> we'll go back and pick up the other two and get them on their way to jail. Yeah. <laughs> We got Dan Clemens settled with his kids at the store and then headed back to Twin Rivers. Brent was kind of wary, but the jinx wagon behaved as if it knew that the outlaw's occupants and back had more than enough of its demon influence. I sent Red to get Sandy Morgan. I told him to tell the livery stable owner that we needed him to identify the bank robbers. The sheriff was pleased enough to jail the bandit gang, but more concerned about the whereabouts of the stolen money. His confusion was understandable, just as it had been to all of us. Because all the time we'd been on the trail, the money had never left Twin Rivers. A lot of the things had come clear to me when I was tied up back in the store. I realized that the bank money had entered the livery stable, but had never come out. There was only one person who could have taken it. Sandy Morgan, the wistful little stable owner. Red had caught him just as he was boarding the stage out of town. Actually, Sandy had put us on a trail that led only one place, right back to him. Where's the money? Well, you won't find anything in there, Marshal, I'm telling you. Just my clothes in there, that's all. That's all. Well, this is the money, all right, Sheriff. The serial number's checked. You want to tell us about it, Sandy? Well, when they rode off that night, I noticed they didn't have that leather satchel with them they came in with. And when I saw the straws and the cobwebs disturbed on the jinx wagon, well, it didn't take me long to find out the hiding place. All right, Sheriff, he's all yours. So Sandy Morgan, who thought he'd outwitted everyone, also fell victim to the curse of the jinx wagon. So long, Sheriff. Don't overfeed him. Better get this wagon back to Dan, Hoppy. We're not taking it back. What? Dan said when we got back to Twin Rivers, he wanted me to give the wagon to you. He said he knowed you'd be mighty proud to own her. Well, dog my cat, Marsha Cassidy. If that ain't the daggone snake story I ever heard. Ha <laughs> <laughs> Hi there, little 
little friends, this is just a thought about guns. I was doing a scene one time in one of the pictures, and the boy that was working with me was twirling his gun on his hand and playing with it. I said, what are you doing with that gun, Lucky? He said, I was just playing with it. I said, those things are not to play with. They kill people. So watch your guns, children. Be careful with them, won't you? There he goes, on his way, down the moonlit trail to where cowboys raid. Hop along, Cassidy. Hop along, Cassidy. He'll return soon again. There's no use to say goodbye until then. Here he comes, here he comes. There's the trumpets, there's the drums. Here he comes. Hop along, Cassidy. to an urgent message from my friend Jim Morgan, Red Connors and I had left our home range to report to his office in Phoenix, Arizona. Come in. Glad to see you, Hoppy. Hi, Jim. You know Red Connors? Yes, of course. How are you, Red? Fine, fine. Have a seat, huh? Thank you very much. What's your problem here? I want you to do a job for the government, Hoppy. A very, very tough one. I'll do anything I can. I was sure you would. That's why I sent for you. You know the Yellow Sands Desert pretty well, don't you? Do we know it? <laughs> 300 square miles of blistering sand and rock. Not a drop of water in the whole blasted place. <laughs> right. And an ideal place for someone wanting to commit mass murder. Here's the story, Hoppy. It wasn't a pretty story. Four weeks ago, in the very heart of the Yellow Sands Desert, a prospector had come across the bodies of six men, all dead of thirst and robbed of their valuables. Investigation had proved that the dead men were aliens without the necessary papers to enter the United States. And that's not the half of it. Ten days ago, a work party repairing a telegraph line came upon the bodies of 12 more men in exactly the same place. All illegal entries, I suppose. Yes, same pattern. A man couldn't live out there in that heat without water. Why, he'd be a plum fool to go out there without at least three canteens full. There wasn't one canteen among them, Red. The tracks of two mounted men and a wagon backtracking to the border told us a fairly complete story. I don't get it. Well, it's pretty obvious, Red. There are thousands of people south of the border just waiting and willing to pay good money to get into the United States. Somebody's getting to them and promising to sneak them across the border. That's exactly my theory, Hoppy. I got it. They're, they're taking these, uh, these Ill, uh, Ill... Illegal. Yeah, these people out in the desert and robbing them and leaving them there to die of thirst. Ah, that's good reasoning, Red. If we'd caught these aliens, we could have deported them. But our service doesn't condone murder. Hoppy, we want the people responsible brought to justice, but what few agents I have available are too well known to work undercover. Well, I'll do my best. Good. I'll deputize you and you'll be acting as my agent. That's fine. Now, let me see here. This is where the bodies were found. They must have brought them directly north across the border. That's about three miles west of the twin towns of Lion Town and Mexico, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, just about. Now, well, that's where we'll start. Good. Good. Right, and we'll keep in touch with you. So long. Twin towns are side by side, the one main street of Lion Town becoming the main street of Mexizona at the border. And on the Mexizona side of the border was the headquarters of my friend Captain Marino, the Mexican Rurales. I had told Captain Marino of my mission here on the border and that since I was going to work undercover, I was going to let it be known that I was working on a survey for a railroad. Do not fear me, amigo. I will keep your secret. But further than that, I can be of little assistance officially. We have law against the aliens crossing to your side of the border. Oh, I know that. I guess I'll just have to catch the men I'm after in the act of taking somebody across the border. But so long as I'm starting from scratch, you know of anybody that might be a suspect? Quien sabe? 
In these border towns, there are many men who would do anything for money. But this I can tell you. Three nights ago, eight Chinese who were working in the nearby mines disappeared without leaving a trace. And I think I know where they can be found. Can you supply me with a pack horse and some water? Certainly, Senor Cassidy. This time, the border runners might leave a clue, something we can follow. We had started out late so we could cover as much of the desert as possible during the cooler hours. Three miles north of the border, we reached the southern edge of the Yellow Sands Desert. And we headed into the heart of it. Within an hour after sunrise, we were in the very heart of the desert. Somewhere out there, I was sure we would find what we were looking for. A few miles farther on, we reached the end of the trail. Scattered in the hot sands were the bodies of the Chinese. The hot sun and thirst had done their ruthless job. But one of them had tried to leave a message. Scrawled in the sand were some characters in the Chinese language. I copied the characters as carefully as I could. What is it? Chinese. What does it say? Read it. Oh, Hoppy, you know I don't read Chinese so good. <laughs> You're better off than I am. I don't read it at all. Well, come on, let's water the horses and we'll rest a while. Gosh, it's hot. Barbecue a buffalo without a fire. Imagine them poor guys out there, left without any water. Yeah, well, somebody's gonna pay for that. What do you suppose that Chinaman was trying to say when he wrote that stuff? Oh, he's probably trying to tell us who was responsible. Uh, maybe we can find out when we get back to the border in the morning. You dry? Sure am. We should have had some more water for those horses, too. Well, that's the story, Captain. A grim one indeed. You know anyone you can trust that can translate that for us? Yes, Sing Lee. He's a laundryman. He speaks Spanish and is my friend. Good. Would you see if you could find him for me? At once. He says, white man with limp who speaks Chinese, betrayer. Gracias, Sing. Well, that's very simple. Now all I have to do is find a lame white man who can speak Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> you have my sympathy, mi amigo. A man of that description is not here in Arizona. Well, I guess all we can do is go across the border to Lion Town and see what we can find there. Thank you very much, Captain. Hasta la vista. The post office seemed the best place to begin asking a few judicious questions. There's a restaurant just across the street. Are you hungry again? I'm starving. We just ate out on the trail. But that was three hours ago. Takes a lot of grub to keep me going. All right, you go over to the restaurant and get something to eat while I talk to the postmaster. Hey, wait a minute. Who does that look like over there? The man talking to the window washer. Well, that's Cal Foster. That couldn't be him. He's still doing time for that job he did up our way. Maybe he got off for good behavior. Good behavior, that guy? Hey, maybe he's our man. No, it couldn't be. He doesn't limp. Not if he speaks Chinese, he had to learn it in prison. I wonder what he's doing here. Three o'clock at my place.
If you're looking for trouble, Cassidy, come and get it. Hold it, Red. Take it easy, Foster. Put up your gun. Look, I served my time, Cassidy, so if you follow me down... I said take it easy and put that gun away. As far as I'm concerned, you've paid your debt to the law. Oh? Well, what are you doing here? I'm here on business. The Arizona and Eastern Railroad's putting a spur line down through here. I'm just waiting for the surveyors to get in. I'm going to act as their guide. Well, it doesn't make any difference what you're doing here. But remember this. If we ever lock horns again, there'll be a little different ending than it was the last time. Is that a threat? And a promise. I'll try and remember that. Oh, Mr. Cassidy, sir. Mr. Cassidy, I heard him call you by name, and I heard what was said. I feel I must warn you. He's a basic nobleman with the danger of the cobra of India and as free of moral values as a jungle savage. Hey, what kind of talk is this? Evidently, we're not only speaking to an educated gentleman, but to one who knows Mr. Foster pretty well. Oh, I've known him for only a short time, sir, and only through having done odd jobs for him. But I know him for the individual that he is. A bitter man with a heart full of hatred for all humanity. You sure got a lot of words. Say, how come a man that can talk like you do has to wash windows and such stuff? A fair question, sir. You see in me the result of circumstance. I, Wilberforce Lawrence Edgemont, once a world traveler, a man of position and means, a college professor, forced through the uses of adversity and liquor to earn my meager food and lodgings by doing odd jobs. Gee, that's tough. Here. Here's a couple of dollars I can spare. You take it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. This is a small fortune to me. And now, if, if you good gentlemen will excuse me, I'll go into the restaurant for a meal. A far better one, I assure you, than would have been my stipend for having washed its windows. If you have any need of my services for an odd job, just feel free to call upon the professor. We shall do that, professor. Poor feller. <laughs> You'll never learn, will you? That was the neatest piece of panhandling I've ever seen in my... I don't see nothing. He's got a limp. Hey. Hey, this may be only a coincidence, but I want you to stay here in town and watch every move he makes. Where are you going? I'm going over and see Captain Marino. I want to get some information. Keep your eye on him. I hate to make a nuisance out of myself, but I need some information. <laughs> you never could be a nuisance to me, senor. Sit down. What is it you wish? I know you're trying to find out as much as you can about strangers that settle here in this community. What do you know about this Cal Foster? He was released about four months ago from the New Mexico State Prison. He has a small ranch five miles south of here where he buys and ships hides. Among us, he has given no trouble. And the man who calls himself the professor. There is little to tell about him except what he himself says. He is obviously what you call a drifter. He came to Lion Town about three months ago. In his spare time, he collects rocks and plants on one side of the border as well as the other. He's supposed to be a little loco. Yeah. This might be only a hunch, but I wish you'd send a telegram for me through your headquarters in Juarez. Gladly. Write it out. The telegram I wrote was to the warden of the New Mexico State Prison, 
I wanted to know if the professor had spent any time in prison while Carol Foster was there. An hour later, there was an answer. That's it. Hmm. Very interesting. Wilberforce Lawrence Edgemont, alias the professor, was a cellmate of Cal Foster while serving two years on a fraud charge. Edgemont has a long prison record, both in the U.S. and abroad. He was released from here three months ago. Well, now all I have to do is find out if the professor speaks Chinese. And until I can prove it, we might be able to stop some of these murders. What can I do? I want you to stake out some of your men at Foster's place every night, from sundown to sunrise. If they see anything suspicious, have them get in touch with me. I'll be at the hotel in line time. I'll do as you wish. Adios, amigo. Thank you, and thanks for the coffee. We're fresh across the border and headed south on the road. I'll make a bet he's on his way to Foster's place. We better follow him. Come on. A short distance south of Mexizona, we caught sight of the professor. Keeping out of sight ourselves, we trailed him to a small ranch house just off the road. the horses. I'm going over there and see if I can find out what's going on. These gentlemen have heard of us. They are anxious to be smuggled across the border to San Francisco. I've told them we have the means of doing exactly that. For a consideration, of course. 5,000 Mexican dollars now, and five more when they're safely delivered. They've agreed to our terms. Well, you don't have a thing to worry about. Nio Chien Chunger Dai Pao. I'll do the dividing later when we have it all. <laughs> you can take the boys into the back room, and after dark, we'll deliver them across the border as usual, under a load of hides. Ray, I'm going to stick here until dark. You take my credentials and go to the postmaster in line town. Tell him to get a posse together. Get him up, Fister. I wanted to warn you, Harvey, but they said they'd kill you if I made a sound. I thought there was something wrong when I saw you prowling around the house. The professional won't have a talk with you. Come on, get moving. Come on. This proves my wisdom in having lookouts posted whenever we're expecting clients. So, Mr. Cassidy, now you're an officer in the Immigration Service. Cassidy, I've been waiting a long time to meet you on even terms. What do you mean, even terms? Hoppy went after you and your two cattle thieving pals single-handed. Brought them all three in. You keep out of here, loudmouth. Cassidy, I'm going to kill you for that. Hold it, Foster. 
I'm still chief around here. What do you mean, hold it? He knows too much. You gotta get rid of him anyway. Agreed. But sometimes I'm amazed at your lack of reasoning power. The Immigration Service is bound to start a search as soon as Cassidy fails to report. If his body is found on this side of the border, it means an international investigation. Then what happens to our lucrative business? Grimes, you and Felton tie him to a chair. What plans do you have in getting rid of him? Simple. Tonight, two wagons loaded with hides will cross the border and go into the Yellow Sands Desert. So we're going to have guests, huh? Hmm. <laughs> well, it's almost time to start moving out. Come on, all of you. We'll load the other wagon. You're going to have a nice long ride, Cassidy. How you count what you're rope? <laughs> Not making any headway yet. <laughs> Keep trying. Manuel! We're going to use your wagon too, so load your hides back on. You, Sophie. These knots will hold till doomsday. Yeah, I'm afraid so. The Chinese and their thirst had given me the one chance in a million. They had been brought here by a Mexican, so I felt sure they must understand a little Spanish. Senor Chino, you amigo, Savi? Si, yo comprendo, amigo. Los otros hombres, and amigos. I tried to explain that the other men were his enemies. They meant to kill them, but he kept insisting they were his friends. You and Felton get Cassidy and Connors. We'll load them in the wagon in the barn before we load the Chinese into Manuel's wagon. Right. Time was running out. There was only one chance left. I told the Chinese to take the notebook from my breast pocket and look at the characters I had copied from the scrawled message in the sand. Why, look. Like Uncle Lufan Sokmari. And amigos. Yeah, you're darn tootin' there, and amigos. Leave her me, pronto. See what's keeping Grimes. Surrender to you, Captain Marino. I think these two Chinese have learned a lesson without any further punishment, don't you? Yeah, besides, they saved their lives. I was in the back where they came from, with an escort. Yours is a hollow victory, Cassidy. Under Mexican law, you cannot force me to accompany you across the border. So I, I shall plead guilty of having fired upon a rally. 
A two-year sentence at the most. <laughs> it is as he says, Senor Hoppy. Yeah, I know. But there's no law against you escorting him to the border and booting him across as an undesirable, is there? You're right. Let us depart for the border and proceed with the booting. Hey, just a minute. What are you doing, Red? I'm getting back that two dollars I gave this joker in Lion Town. There. Now you may depart for the border and proceed with the booting. <laughs> Hi there. You know there are certain laws that are made to protect all of us, but we must do something to help about that protection. Well, here's a thought that might help prevent an accident. Help other people protect you. Now, to make it a little easier for you to remember those words, the first letter of each of those words spell the name of a man who thinks you're pretty wonderful and who doesn't want you to be hurt. So till next week, so long. In the meantime, be careful, won't you? There he goes, on his way, down the moonlit trail to where cowboys raised. Hop along, Cassidy. Hop along, Cassidy. He'll return soon again. There's no use to say goodbye until then. There's the drums, here he comes Hop along Cassidy Like we lost them. Yeah, I guess so. What do you suppose they were up to? Oh, it's hard to tell. At least we might have stopped somebody getting killed. I wish we'd have had a good look at them. Well, the one riding bareback looked like an Indian. I ain't so sure, Hoppy, but I think I saw him on the bar 20 this morning. On the bar 20? Yeah. I hollered at him and he took off like a scared jackrabbit. You ride on into town and get the supplies. I'll meet you there. I'm going to see if I can't pick up a trail. Don't you want me to go with you? I think I can manage. Somehow. Oh, Hoppy. <laughs> I didn't have much hope in picking up a trail, but thought it was worth a try, especially after seeing how determined those gunmen were to shoot the bareback rider. Also, Red's remark about thinking he'd seen the boy on the bar 20 increased my interest. I wondered why he'd been hanging around and why he'd ridden off in such a hurry when noticed.
sign of the fair one is very strong. I see happiness in store for you and many children. Your lifeline is long. You will live many years. I will read your destiny in one moment, Frau. Frau? That means friend. Oh, well, I don't know, I guess. Wait. The tall one you spoke of who rides the bay horse will ask you to marry him. That is all Mother Kayomi sees for you. So that bad luck will not overtake you. You must cross my palm with silver. And now for you. Well, I ain't got much time, I but... You are afraid your friends will see you? Do not be ashamed. I have read the palm for many wise men, just like you. Sit down. Well, maybe just a quick look. You have a very interesting palm. I do? Yes. You are a bachelor, and you eat much. How did you know that? It's in your hand. I see you and a man on a white horse riding to a strange adventure. I must talk quickly and tell Frau Cassidy he must ride two miles north of town. He will find a sign. What are you talking about? Why should I tell you? Shh, quiet. Deliver my message and say to him, Calvato. Good things will come to you. I see love in your heart line. To keep the evil spirits away, you must cross my palm with silver. Oh. There you are. I sure don't want to get into any trouble. A thousand thanks. Remember what Kayomi has said to you. Yeah. Red sheepishly admitted he hadn't bought the supplies. He'd wasted his time having his fortune told. He started telling me what the old gypsy woman said. When he said I was to ride two miles north of town where I'd find a sign, I didn't take much stock in it. But when he mentioned the name Calvato, it struck a responsive chord in my memory. I wanted to talk to the gypsy woman at once. Red said she was sitting right over there. The fortune teller was gone. Red mentioned the man she'd seemed afraid of. He too had disappeared. I told Red to mount up, we'd get the supplies later. north, I explained why the name Calvato interested me. Seven years ago, the Bahara tribe of gypsies were in this section when Wells Fargo was robbed of a $30,000 gold shipment. An old gypsy called Calvato was found murdered. However, the money wasn't recovered and the killing was never cleared up. The whole tribe just vanished into thin air and nothing had been heard of them since. Glancing over my shoulder, I caught a fleeting glimpse of two riders. I cautioned Red not to tip off. We knew we were being followed. Let's 
Get out of here. Again, we didn't get a close look at our good friends, but I was reasonably sure it was the same two men we had seen chasing the bareback rider, and Red thought the smaller one was the man he'd seen on the street. We were two miles north of town. Red thought I'd gone out of my mind, but as I looked around, I saw the gypsy sign. piece of cloth signifying there was a message nearby. I knew what we'd find near that bush. I showed it to Red. The twigs pointing to the right indicated a turn in that direction. If the long side of the twigs were to the left, I would have turned that way. The three stones told another message. The first stone was a larger one. It meant I would be received as a friend. If this stone were smaller than the other two, it would mean danger. The two stones farthest to the right designated a distance of two miles to be traveled before I reached my destination. Red expected all kinds of trouble. He thought if anyone wanted to see us so badly, they should be there to welcome us. However, I had an idea that gypsies were near and would soon show themselves. Although Mother Kayomi had talked to Red before, I introduced them formally. Then we met Artera and the girl Morella. Artera was the son of Colvato, the man suspected of the Wells Fargo robbery. For the past seven years, the boy had been in bondage to Lasho, king of the Bahara tribe. According to their laws, he had to work out his bondage to pay for the disgrace his father had brought upon the tribe. Two weeks ago, Artera became of age. He ran away with Morella and the old woman. Morella and Artera were to be married, but they couldn't enter into a marriage ceremony until the boy cleared his father's name. My father did not steal the $30,000. Before he died, he whispered to Mother Kayomi that he'd taken the money from the real robber and intended to return it to the rightful owners. Artera's father could not tell me much, except that the money was buried on your property and that he had left a sign. Do you have any idea who it was? He did not live long enough to give me a name. Mother Kayomi and I violated tribal laws, running away with our taro. But I would rather die under King Lasho's whip than to be separated from our taro. You will help us. Oh, of course I will. They try, Fral. You knew my father? I knew him very well. He was a good man. He did not steal. We will find you gold, and I will return it to you, Wells Fargo Company. Doggone it, Artero. Why haven't you done something about this before? Red, he's already told you. These people live according to their own laws. Hey, where is King Lasho and the rest of your tribe now? Many miles from here. A five-day ride. And who were those two men you were running away from this morning? I do not know. They followed us soon after we left. Now, we'll keep an eye on them. We have only this knife for protection. We have not even built a fire to cook our food for fear the smoke would betray our camp. Well, how long since you had? Two days. Two days? Yes. Without food? <laughs> I'm afraid my friend couldn't stand that. You better hook up your horses and come over to my place. You can cook and eat there. Oh, for Al Cassidy. Sure, you might just as well, since you'll be on the bar 20 hunting for the money anyway. Hey, by the way, Artero, didn't I see you on the bar 20 this morning? Yes, but you see, I would just... Come on, Red, it. come on.
chops and potatoes. There's a little more there. <laughs> more potatoes, Mose. Them gypsies sure have funny notions, don't they? Well, that might seem funny to you. What a good it did to bring them over here. Well, they figure so long as our terror has a spell on him, they'd bring them bad luck if they came into the house. Bad luck or good luck didn't affect their appetites any. Nor yours either. I'm going over and see Mother Kaomi. I haven't the slightest idea what kind of a sign she's looking for to find that money. Come on. Be with you as soon as finish these potatoes. If they don't finish you. Ah, from Cassidy. Ah, you feel better? Yes, thank you. This hot food does much for us. Ah, that's good. Where is Mother Kaomi? In the wagon. She wished to consult her cards. She thinks it will help her to find the gold. <laughs> we sure need something. <clears throat> Tell me nothing. Ah, uh, that's what I wanted to talk to you about. About finding a sign that may indicate where that money is hidden. There must be a curse upon us. Oh, but there can't be. You're only trying to right a wrong. You have great wisdom, Frau Cassidy. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to send Red out with you. I want you to search every tree and every rock. Old Vato must have left a sign that you can understand. We will do as you bid. But are you not coming with us? I'll be riding nearby. I still have an idea that those men will be around watching every move you make. But we are on your property. Yeah, but a few fences won't stop those killers. You are a good man. The blessings of our people will be upon you. Thank you. For two days, I circled about keeping an eye open for those gunslingers. They were around all right. I never saw them, but did cross their trail. They had been joined by a third man whose horse left a peculiar track. Then I found a campsite where they bedded down. That third man was really unusual. This was where and how he slept. Boy said it belonged to his father. Any sign of the gold? No, not yet, but I've dug so many holes, I'm beginning to feel like a gopher. <laughs> You're beginning to look like one, oh, too. Come on. I would know that dagger a hundred years later. He is right. The dagger was Calvato's. I have seen it many times. Did you find any other sign? Nothing. Well, we better keep working. Fortunately, I stumbled onto something the others had missed. The tree had grown in seven years, but there on the bark were faint marks which carried around the tree. Hey, look at this. I showed the gypsies the outline Colfato must have cut in the bark when he buried the money. Mother Kaomi excitedly interpreted the sign at once. The gold was buried under the tree, all right, but on the opposite side. You hit on something. At last, I can return this money and save our names from disgrace. Oh, Tara, I'm so happy for you. Now, we better get this gold back to the house and count it. To be sure, but it is all there. Calvato would not take one coin. Well, let's get her in the wagon. Yeah, and we better keep our eyes open for those three men, too. Yes. Three men? That's right. Another man joined them. 
Did you see him? No, I didn't, but I have an idea who he was. Well, but who? What? Now, don't ask questions. Remember, gypsies don't accuse anyone unless they're real sure. Oh. <laughs> you will go with me to the Wells Fargo Company? No, not just yet. But I do not understand. Our terror just taking the gold back isn't going to clear your father's name. But I will tell them the truth. He did not steal it. I know, I know, and they'll thank you for your honesty. But how are you going to prove he didn't steal the money in the first place? He is right, Arturo. We still could not take the marriage vows. What shall I do? I think the first thing we better do is get out of this open country of that gold. Then I have an idea how I can clear your father's name. Good. We gave the gypsies plenty of supplies, then loaded the boxes and sent them on their way with our best wishes. As they drove off, Red and I hoped we were being watched. heavy. They can't all be filled with gold. Better send him back here. You keep your eye on the gypsies. Jeff wants you. You got three boxes here. Which one of them's got the gold? They're all heavy. This one here in the middle. Get your hands up. Get on off that horse. Get on here. I had an idea you were the one back of this. You hired these two gunnies here to follow this boy around so you could get your hands on this gold again, isn't that right? Yes. There were only three people that knew anything about where this gold was or what kind of a box it was in. The Wells Fargo Company, this boy's father, and you. When you came in here and picked out the right box, I knew you were the one that originally stole it. And just to make you feel real good, there's no gold in any of the boxes. They're filled with rocks. So you stole the money and killed my father. Well, the old fool, he wanted to return it. So I killed him when he refused to tell me where he hid it. Wait a minute, Dr. Carroll. We'll let the law take care of him. Yes, Frau Cassidy. All right, get on your horses. Goodbye. Bye. Goodbye, 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 Red. I hope you can come to the wedding festival. We're going to try to. Thank you for everything. To try, Frau. And a long life to you, Mother Kyle. Yes, Goodbye, Fred. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye.
Hobby. Yeah? How did you know the third member of that gang was a gypsy? I found where he slept. Oh, yeah. I don't understand. They're very superstitious people. When they sleep on the ground, they put little twigs all around them. Keeps the evil spirits away. Oh, yeah. I don't understand. Come and get it! That you understand, don't you? Let's get it. <laughs> Hi there, friends. You know, sometimes a smile will buy things that money can't buy. But there's something pretty important that goes with that smile. Good teeth. A lot of people worry about going to the dentist. Remember that he's just as nice a guy as any other guy, and he wants to help you. So go and see him at least once a year, maybe twice a year. Brush your teeth good twice every day, too. Will you do that for me? There he goes, on his way, down the moonlit trail to where cowboys ray. Hop along Cassidy, hop along Cassidy, he'll return soon again. There's no use to say goodbye until then. 